good evening everybody in the previous uh, chapter we had seen what was cpb or what was cardiopulmonary bypass so since we have an idea of cardiopulmonary bypass we should now go into the components of the cardiopulmonary bypass what are the actual gadgets that are used what are the actual disposables that are used in a cardiopulmonary bypass system so now coming to the components mainly we have the pumps or the heart lung machine in addition we have disposable components like the oxygenators filters connectors and tubings which connect the patient to the heart lung machine and there is a cardioplegia system which is an important and integral part of the heart lung machine it would be discussed in the next few hours and of course the primes now coming to an oxygenator the oxygenator as we have seen is also known as the lung of the patient or it acts as the lungs of the patient so what should be the ideal manufacturing criteria for an oxygenator so first of all there should be effective gas transfer across the oxygenator also it should have a smaller surface area at the same time it should oxygenate the blood in a very efficient way and also in a membrane oxygenator for example there is a transmembrane which separates the blood and the gas so and gas exchange takes place by diffusion so the diffusion efficiency should be very good in an oxygenator in a bubble oxygenator there is direct interface of gas and blood and also the diffusion in a bubble oxygenator in the same way should be very efficient so such should be the criteria on which an oxygenator has to be manufactured now what are the ideal characteristics of an oxygenator how good should an oxygenator be so let us look into the points first of all it should be safe and efficient it should have a considerable smaller priming volume so that there is minimum hemodilution of the patient it should not create trauma to the blood and it should overcome the barrier of diffusion distance that is the distance between the gas and the blood phase should be as minimum as possible and it should be assembled easily in case of emergencies the hands on uh, work should be done with ease and it should be very user friendly and of course it should have minimum air embolism capacity though there are various gadgets to avoid air embolism even though they could be negligible amount of air trapped within the oxygenator so this should not be sent into the patient so that ability has to be taken care of the oxygenator now when we look at the types of the oxygenator from the history of their origin initially they were using the disc oxygenator due to certain disadvantages the next generation of bubble oxygenator came into existence nowadays so after the bubble oxygenators even more advanced oxygenators that are the membrane oxygenators are currently used now just we'll have a look at the disc oxygenator this was of course used for a very long time and it was originally developed by dr k and cross so the principle of this is there were numerous discs which were stacked centrally and these were kept circulating in a pool of blood that is the patient's blood there were two types of containers into which the patient's blood were collected one was a steel cylinder and also a glass chamber so two types were there and here what happens is uh, the blood which comes from the patient gets into this chamber where it comes into a number of rotating discs these discs are exposed to oxygen on the top so whenever these discs bring in a column of blood to the top it gets oxygenator 
but since there were other disadvantages like foaming and frothing and also trauma to the blood, the next generation of oxygenators evolved. That is the bubble oxygenator. So, what happens in a bubble oxygenator? Bubble oxygenator was designed by Dewall and Lilly. Here, there is direct interface of gas and blood. So, whenever the venous blood drains into the oxygenator, it is bubbled directly with the oxygen that is given into the oxygenator. This bubbling may cause froth and foam. So, these are collected in an arterial chamber in which are incorporated a deforming agent and a debubbling column. So, this foamed blood or the frothy blood gets deformed and filtered and gets collected in the arterial chamber, arterial reservoir. From here, it is taken by the arterial pump into the patient directly. Now, what were the disadvantages because of this, of a bubble oxygenator? Since there was direct interface of gas and blood, blood trauma was more and plasma protein destruction was also seen. Though there were advantages like it was easy to assemble and uh, it was of lower cost, but because of these disadvantages and also because of direct bubbling of oxygen, the PCO2 would, could not be controlled and the PO2 also could not be controlled because there was excess of oxygen and there was hyperoxygenation and excess removal of carbon dioxide. So, carbon dioxide removal could not be maintained with this bubble oxygenator. So, researchers wanted to develop a more physiological oxygenator from this. Now, the next generation and the present generation which is using is the membrane oxygenators. This was designed by Dr. Kolf and here the advantage is there is a gas permeable membrane. So, there is no direct blood and gas contact as in the bubble oxygenator. So, this membrane was more physiological to our human lung. Now, just having a glance at the gas transfer in a bubble oxygenator, there is direct transfer of gas from the bubble to the blood. So, oxygen from the bubble directly diffuses into the deoxygenated blood and the deoxygenated blood with more carbon dioxide gets into the bubble and escapes. Here, there are microporous membranes. So, inside the pore, the gas flows and the blood keeps circulating around the pores. So, here once the medical air blends with oxygen and sent into the pores, here also through the semipermeable membrane, the gas transfer takes place. So, gas from the pore gets into the blood and vice versa. Now, let us look into the membrane oxygenator, which is the current used membrane. So, actually this membrane has a hard shell reservoir and a membrane portion. So, this is called the venous reservoir, which is made up of hard shell polycarbonate material, which makes it easily visible and sturdy. Now, inside the venous reservoir, you have two types of filters. There is the venous filter and the cardiotomy filter. So, it is into this cardiotomy filter that the cardiotomy and the venous suctions drain. Now, coming to the membrane. The membrane has three portions. One is the blood column, the second is the gas column and the integral heat exchanger. So, gas enters and oxygenates the blood and there is a heat exchanger inside the membrane which either cools or warms the patient during the cardiac surgery. 